thank you very much for coming and for starting off our conference and what I'm sure will be a very colorful and beautiful way. Excuse my voice. That's just a little water. I hope it pulls up. I want to thank the organizers for um, arranging this. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this conference. Um, I have to say that this is a, a little bait and switch. I've changed the uh, title and the topic, so if you read the abstract, forget that. Um, I'm going to talk about emergent and formal uh, structures. And uh, let's see if I clicker works too. So here's uh, an outline. We're going to do some background on uh, classical and discrete conformal geometry uh, in the circle packing sense of discrete. And um, then we're going to talk a little more about what you can do with this discrete geometry. And then we're going to talk about the uh, subject of the title, uh, emergent. Uh, I hope to explain what that means. Um, these have to be examples we'll um, be looking at. But I just wanted to illustrate that there's a huge variety of surfaces out there. Everything from theoretical, entirely abstract surfaces to very concrete ones. Um, things you want to visualize, things you want to analyze, things you want to build. So uh, we're going to be talking about a variety of uh, surfaces. And uh, in the background, I want to talk about conformal geometry first and then a little bit of circle packing. What you um, have to understand with circle packing is that the uh, pictures um, should try to carry you through it. I'll give you the very basics, but I can't take the time to, um, to go into many details. And people often wonder, well, how do you get the circle packings and so on? And that's a separate question that I'll uh, pass over. The idea with circle packings is going to be that you just look at them as methods of warping uh, a region and putting a geometry on it. And so I uh, hope the pictures carry you through. Um, and then I'll at least mention the enabling theory behind this. It's not all um, pictures. I do want to start with the uh, classical uh, smoke and mirrors of uh, conformal structure. A Riemann surface is basically uh, a surface on which you have a consistent way to measure angles. And consistent means you have a, an atlas. So you have local charts. And the overlap uh, functions, the transition functions, have to be uh, conformal. So they preserve angles in uh, magnitude and orientation. And so that's the uh, class of uh, objects we're going to work with. And conformal structure resides somehow in this web of consistency relationships. I like the term web because it always brings in uh, a little sort of combinatoric feel to it. Actually, uh, there is no there there. I like to say about Riemann surfaces, there is no there. All you know about the surface is how to represent little pieces. And all you know about it is the consistency internal consistency of these different views of the object. Now, conformal maps are just uh, maps between Riemann surfaces which preserve uh, angles. Well, conformal mapping is everywhere. One of the reasons is this uh, ancient and honorable theorem, the Riemann mapping theorem, which says basically every simply connected Riemann surface is up to a conformal map, either the plane, the disk, or the sphere. And um, there are a lot of extensions of that. So um, covering theory extends it to uh, entirely uh, general Riemann surfaces. It's a core topic in mathematics. And I think if you trace back things that have come out of this, it's a huge range of, of topics. Um, and then on the other hand, in applications, there's another huge range of uh, topics, from engineering to physics to um, visualization and computer science. The problem with uh, all of this, in some sense, is that you have to be able to, in some practical sense, either compute these or build them or manipulate them. And so that's the question here, the practical uh, approach to uh, working with these. And so um, I'm giving just a, uh, excuse the, the slide, just a little uh, background on what I look for, at least when I discretize something. And. Um, I put this picture of the uh, curve up there because we're also familiar with how you discretize a, uh, a curve. And um, with video games and so on, we're pretty 
familiar with how you discretize surfaces. Uh, what you want out of your discretization is uh, some geometric intuitions. So you want certain properties to be uh, reflected in the discrete situation. You want uh, discrete versions of the classical objects. Uh, and now you want computability. And you want uh, some refinement procedure. That is, uh, if I went to that curve and made it a finer, uh, more vertices and smaller edges, I could approximate the classical object more closely. And what you actually hope for is convergence to the classical objects under that refinement scheme. So those are, I think, sort of the things you look for when you discretize something. And so, as I said, with video games, everybody's familiar, you know, with your, whether your computer puts up 20 million triangles per second or something. All those surfaces are discretized one way or another. Um, well, I'm actually going to uh, modify that picture a little. Uh, what I want you to visualize is this. So, presumably in a microscope, if you look down at that surface, um, instead of infinitesimal circles, you see this pattern of very small circles that fit together. And the triangulation is really determined by how those circles fit together. You draw a connection between uh, the centers of tangent circles, and you see the triangulation is realizing that collection of centers and edges. So um, that's what I want you to think of. When you think of a Riemann surface, think of being able to swoop in on it and see that uh, discrete structure sort of granularized in terms of circles. So Thurston, in that uh, conference that Chris mentioned, had an excellent idea. Um, and that, that uh, talk of Thurston's, I'll say, it was just um, a gorgeous talk and really caught my attention. But you know how it is. I um, had things to do, things to write, grants to uh, defend. And so um, I put it off all summer long until I got the paper of uh, Roden and Sullivan a preprint uh, proving the conjecture. Um, fortunately, I was already hooked by them. So uh, the fact that the conjecture was established um, didn't stop me from uh, inquiring into the topic. So here's his idea. You have a simply connected um, plane domain, and you want to do a conformal mapping uh, to the disk or from the disk to that. I'm going to work from the disk. So uh, what suggested uh, was suggested was you take a hexagonal pattern of circles. Every circle has six neighbors. They're all the same size. You cookie cut out the region in the shape of omega. And then uh, Thurston pointed out um, a result I now call the curva andrea thurston theorem, which said that I could repack that collection of uh, circles, that pattern of circles, in the unit disk. And uh, the boundary circles here are the horocycles. So every circle on the boundary here is now among one of those horror cycles out at the edge. And so the connection between these is that they have the same number of circles. And if I mark two circles here with names, if they're tangent in the picture on the right, then the corresponding circles are tangent in the picture on the left. So it's the same pattern of tangency. That's the connection. And so um, then you can set up a uh, map. And if you want, you can think of the map as a map between the circle centers or just a map between collection of circles. And we'll make that more concrete in a minute. But for now, just you have a sort of natural connection between these two. His uh, conjecture was this, that if you uh, use increasingly fine hexagonal packings on the right here, make them smaller and more numerous, and repack, define the map, there's one normalization which is standard in complex variables anyway. Put something at the center and something on the real axis. Then the uh, discrete maps you define here successively will converge uniformly on compact sets to the actual classical conformal map. And so that conjecture, conjecture was uh, the basis of uh, at least my interest in the topic. So I have a picture here that shows um, a few stages of that. So you start out with a relatively coarse collection of circles and uh, repack that. You make it finer, repack that. Make it finer, repack that. So the idea is that this sequence of maps, um, you can actually see some of the conformal um, information. So for example, uh, regions which are close to the uh, origin 
will be large circles. That's basically a reflection of the harmonic measure that they enjoy. So there are a lot of things you can see in here if uh, I let you have the time, but I'm going to move on. So that's uh, Thurston's conjecture. That those uh, converge to the actual conformal map. So now let me uh, say a few things about uh, circle packing. And let me put up that picture while I get So there are three uh, main objects in circle packing. There's the uh, combinatoric pattern, K. Um, and so you look on the left here in those pictures, and you want to think of that as an abstract pattern. Of course, it's, it's made so that uh, it has some recognizable features here. But you can just draw a triangulation. That's your K. Then um, there's a configuration of circles, which has exactly um, that collection of uh, that pattern of tangency. So uh, it's easy to pick out the eyes here. And between the uh, two eyes, for example, there are these rows of uh, vertices. So every vertex here has a circle here. And if two vertices are connected by an edge, then their circles are tangent. Um, by the way, when you connect the centers of these circles, you get an embedding of the uh, complex. And so this graph and this graph are isomorphic as graphs. The thing is, uh, what, I, what I like to think of is that you've taken an abstract combinatoric, and by forcing this uh, collection of circles to fit together, you've given a geometry to that abstract um, triangulation. And the typical op uh, operation is to uh, start with K, then you compute the, uh, the radii that are going to fit together, and that uses uh, a notion of angle sum. And all this was actually uh, shown by Thurston, and he even suggested the algorithm that's used to compute these. And then you lay out the circle packings. More recently, there's a, uh, an algorithm that may do the last two stages together and uh, improve performance considerably. Um, what's surprising after you see it is the uh, plasticity in these uh, configurations. And so I take that same uh, owl. All of these have the same abstract combinatorics I've tried to picture here. So you can work in the Euclidean plane, you can work in the hyperbolic plane, I change some uh, circles on the boundary. Here's that uh, packing with the horocycles on the boundary. You can uh, designate four corners and make a rectangle out of the packing. Uh, you can put it on the uh, Riemann sphere. And so uh, there's great plasticity here. And I haven't even mentioned uh, branch points, which we aren't going to be using in this talk. But you can do uh, a lot of things with these circle packings. Now, uh, behind this is uh, the theory, and I'm just going to briefly mention it. So the beginning is uh, a theorem that Thurston gave. Um, he told me one time that he proved it in the morning, discovered that it followed from something in uh, Andrea in the afternoon, but then it was six or seven years before somebody um, came across Kerba's work from 1930s, where it had been proven then. So it, I call it the curve andre of Thurston theorem. Any triangulation of a sphere, there's a, a circle packing, essentially unique up to Mervius transformations, with that pattern of tangencies. And so that got the uh, whole ball rolling. Um, that was um, proved by uh, Bert Roden and Dennis Sullivan using the quasi-conformal mapping to, to get the convergence. It's been generalized in many different directions, uh, extended to, uh, by various authors to uh, more general combinatorics in particular, and also more, more general um, topological situations. And that extension still used quasi-conformal uh, mapping theory. Then there's a uh, beautiful, beautiful argument by Peth and Schramm, yeah, which is um, extremely clever. It's elementary in the sense that it doesn't use much, but it's a very clever proof. They got rid of the quasi-conformal um, connection. So they removed that and were able to show very general um, result about convergence of these. So general, in fact, that they observed the uh, following, that this theorem is equivalent to the Riemann mapping theorem for plane domains. Once you move, remove the quasi-conformal mapping, uh, you remove the difficulty of possible circular arguments. So, so that says it's a deep theorem, I think. Well, there's uh, more, and I just want to 
sketched a, a little of the theory that I was going to talk about. Uh, circle packing, refinement, convergence, all extend, for example, to uh, Riemann surfaces, various other settings and geometries. Uh, you include a notion of branch points, you get uh, discrete analytic functions. So rather than just mapping one plane domain onto another, you might map uh, a plane domain onto uh, some part, portion of a surface or map between uh, two Riemann surfaces. And there's, a, in fact, a fairly comprehensive discrete theory of analytic functions. Um, so I like to say that circle packing is quantum complex analysis, classical in the limit. Try to include all those buzzwords when you... Um, overlooked here so far, but very important to our um, talk here is that there's a very practical and provable algorithm for uh, computing circle packing mainly computing those radii. And um, there's software that I've been uh, developing over many years and it's really available, not particularly user friendly yet, but uh, very capable software. And so uh, just to give you an illustration, the largest packing I know of uh, was done by Bill Floyd using uh, the packing algorithm and that has um, just short of five million circles in it. So you can do significant uh, collections of uh, circles. So now let's move from the uh, sort of classical um, stuff and uh, see how we can use that circle packing. And so I want to first uh, mention the uh, companions to, to uh, conformal structure that we're going to be concentrating on. It brings a lot with it. In addition to conformal maps, there are connections to Brownian motion. There are connections to harmonic uh, measure on uh, boundaries of regions and connections to extremal length. And so using this simple plane domain, I want to um, illustrate these. So for example, if you mark a, um, an arc on the boundary, if you take that conformal map to the unit disk, which uh, Riemann's theorem, for example, gives you, then um, that arc is carried, uh, that boundary arc is carried to an arc of the circle. And you can read off, if you put the um, uh, yellow dot at the origin, you can read off the harmonic major. So the conformal map is a way to compute the harmonic measure relative to the yellow dot of that blue arc. Suppose you had two arcs. I like the example of uh, pretending this is a conducting plate. You put a voltage of one on the red, a voltage of zero on the blue, and you ask, what's the uh, voltage at the yellow dot? And so it's known that uh, that's related to the extreme of length between uh, these uh, two, it's related, uh, and you can get it explicitly in the following way. It's actually defined it intrinsically in terms of the extremal length of curve families. But an easy way to do it in practice is to map this to a rectangle uh, such that the uh, blue and red arcs are the ends of the rectangle. Then the voltage drop from one down to zero is linear, and you can just read off where the yellow dot is. So those are the companions uh, to conformal structure we're going to talk about. So if you conformally map a region, these, uh, this other information comes along. So now we want to look at the discretized version. We're going to, um, instead of um, Brownian motion, now you're talking about random walks. And discrete harmonic major, discrete extremal length. Um, so the idea is that we take our region, we cut out uh, circle packing. For example, we mark the uh, arcs and the boundary of interest. All this is now a little approximate because you don't fill up exactly the region. You have the boundary arcs close to those uh, circles. But now you can map that in the disk and you can measure the uh, harmonic measure of the uh, blue arc. You can map it to a rectangle so that the uh, ends of these uh, arcs, the four points, get mapped to the corners. And then you have the extremal length of the rectangle. Um, so that's uh, the discrete version of what we saw uh, classically a minute ago. So you can do those maps discreetly now and you can actually do them in practice for more complicated regions. So um, I uh, use the term discrete conformal map then for a map which has in common uh, the same combinatorics but two different realizations of it. And so if you um, think about uh, the information which is common to all the realizations of the triangulation in a sense, you could, should put that information on the triangulation. So it's really the triangulation somehow that has this information already in it, and your realizations give you different pictures of it. 
but things that are more or less preserved um, should be attached to uh, this object. And so what I propose is uh, this. So a conformal structure is this web of relationships between uh, maps in an atlas, transition maps. Um, for us, the discrete conformal structure is really just in the triangulation. Um, so if, if you, um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. This uh, conformal structure is going to be the, the key uh, role here. We'll see that um, this loose definition has a sort of emergent character. So maybe I'll put off uh, if I understood your question. But uh, basically, if I, uh, I take this complex, someone can give me, for example, uh, radii for the boundaries. And I can calculate the radii for the inside so that it actually lays out uh, as a circle packing in the plane. And um, so if I start measuring things like harmonic measure of a, a number of circles on the boundary in that realization, and then somebody says, well, I'll change all the boundary radii and lay it out like this, then the harmonic measure is not exactly preserved, but is sort of quasi-preserved under the map. So I want to sort of attach that to the complex rather than think of it in the realization itself. So here's the uh, real topic I want to get to. And um, so we'll talk about the basic idea. I'm going to give you experimental uh, support for that, try to give at least a hint of the intuition behind it, and then see um, what's, uh, what's involved. There's some subtleties about it, which uh, I hope to bring out at the end. So uh, here's what we've done so far. We have the uh, region. And in a way, uh, when we put those uh, hexagonal uh, packings and circles in, if you look at the carrier, that is the underlying um, edges and vertices, you now have a um, triangulation of that region. So in our sense, that was a, that's a discrete conformal structure for that region. And so I could move it to the disk or move it to a rectangle. So the idea is uh, to do this instead. We're going to take a random triangulation of that region. And I'll say more about how I build this random triangulation in a minute, but um, it certainly looks pretty random. Um, you take a random triangulation of the region. And so that's what I'm um, doing. I'm going to replace those triangulations associated with the uh, cookie cut circle packing, replace it by a random triangulation. But there's no circle packing. There's no circle packing whatever so far. Uh, only to get that picture, I use circles. But this, uh, this has no circles in it at all. So let's go back to our um, picture, uh, the companion idea. So we have the uh, same picture, essentially, except that the triangulation just starts out as a random triangulation. But uh, remember that it's a triangulation. And actually, any triangulation I can get, for example, uh, maximal packing in the hyperbolic plane with the boundary vertices from the triangulation being the horizontals. Or I can uh, mark or or vertices in the triangulation and map it to a rectangle. And so we can do everything we did before, it's just that the triangulation is a random one now. And so um, I call this emergent conformal structure for the reasons that uh, sort of summarize here and that I'll try to convince you uh, makes sense. So, just for those of us who didn't really like the part about the way possible, would this look like putting down a random ellipse field or something and then putting the closet and all that goes on? That is analogous to uh, I'd like to talk about that. I'm not sure. One thing uh, that comes in is you have to figure out why there's any geometry at all in a uh, triangulation, a random triangulation. And um, not to give anything away, my random triangulations are going to be del and A triangulation. So circles come in in a strange way there. But um, I don't know anything about ellipse fields, random ellipse fields, but we can talk about that. So my setting is I have a region like that. We've pictured omega, and I have a couple designated points for normalization, and I have the classical conformal map from omega to the uh, disk. And um, 
Now we're going to develop random maps. So a random map is uh, for a very large ant, well, not a very large, but reasonably large ant. I wanted to find a random map as follows. I select a random triangulation in omega with n vertices. I compute the uh, maximal circle packing, that is the circle packing that lies in the hyperbolic plane with exactly the same complex. And uh, then I define uh, a map from, uh, from my random triangulation to the carrier. That's just the triangles underlying the circle packing. And I'll be more specific in a later slide. Now you have to uh, have a normalization. So the uh, point is that I can apply a Mergius transformation to my circle packing get the point I want at the origin and the other point on the positive axis. So that's just the normalization. So these maps are um, analogs of the classical conformal map, but they started out, and that's the only random step, by the way, that first one. The rest is determined then. And so my conjecture is that this, uh, this, if you start with omega, f, and these fn's, then the fn's converge in probability to the classical conformal map as n goes to infinity. What that means, for example, is that if you um, look, say, uh, the distance in uh, some norm on, uh, so these are all maps, by the way, from omega, one-to-one -one maps from omega to the disk. And so you can put a topology on that, like uniform uh, convergence on compact sets, and it says, um, take any neighborhood of the origin, and the probability that your random map and the capital F, the map you're trying to approximate, are, um, are not in that neighborhood of the origin. The, the probability that the difference is not in the neighborhood of the origin goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So these are looking more and more like capital F in a probabilistic sense. How do you measure probability? Um, yeah, so I'll talk about triangulation. What I'm uh, doing is uh, I'm throwing in points randomly distributed. And then I'm triangulating. I don't know uh, what that means uh, in this it's setting. It's a just natural way of putting things in so equal areas get equal Yes, probability. yes. Uh, I can speculate and I'll... Yeah, independent. Yeah. I'm going to uh, speculate that uh, this uh, generalizes uh, from plane domains, which is really uh, the first setting. And it's exactly the question of what random means that uh, comes up when you try to generalize this. So I want to go back to that picture of uh, that comes out of Thurston's conjecture. I modified it a little. We have a finer, finer uh, triangulations. Uh, remember the triangles on the right, I don't show you the circles here, but those all come from hexagonal packings. And this is color coded. Um, what happens is the red and the blue indicate the quasi conformal distortion of the map. So you define a map from here to here based on that uh, circle packing connection. It's actually defined on the faces here to the faces here. And on each face, you figure out the quasi conformal distortion on that face. It's an affine map. And you color code it. Light red, almost white, means there's almost no distortion. And one thing that fascinate, fascinates me in this topic is every experiment you run, something jumps out at you. And this one, see those three white spots? I don't know what it means conformally. But at any rate, the, um, the darker red means slightly more distortion. And in this picture, everything that uh, is distorted by more than uh, k equal 1.1 sort of 10% distortion, if you want, is blue. So as you'd expect, there's more distortion out of the boundary. But as you, um, in, as you refine this uh, packing, the distortion in the middle gets smaller and smaller, closer to 1. And that's how you get uh, conformal convergence out of this. I have not. What's amazing to me is that they're, they're at the very basic first stage. And uh, these are very close to the boundary combinatorially. So somehow it's picking up information very quickly. 
and then it persists. Well, let's compare that to what we're going to do. And this, uh, this picture shows the same idea, except I moved the threshold up to 2. So everything with uh, dilatation greater than uh, 2 is blue. So in a random triangulation, see, you don't get any control over the, the K. There's just the distortion, quasi-conformal distortion, all over the place. And the idea, of course, is that we're talking about uh, convergence in a different way. So you aren't going to be able to uh, get this converging to the conformal map by looking at the quasi-conformal maps. It's just uh, complete chaos in there. So maybe the size of the distortion is large, but the angle of the distortion is different. These cancel out some of the weak sense of the limit. Yeah, I hope we see that. Okay. They cancel out somehow. But um, you have no, absolutely no upper bound on the K. So the conjecture is true in there. Based on how many Well, based on. No, I don't believe anything to do with that. So that's exactly the uh, point. So what gives you any confidence in this? And I'm, I'm hoping to give you some confidence in it with uh, experiments. But first, let me show the construction. Oh, before, before I leave that one, I want to point out that the um, proving the conjecture itself is a matter of looking at the uh, convergence of these maps. And right now, I don't have a way to suggest to do that. But there are other things that you attach to the conformal structure. And so those are other random variables. And we're going to look at those random variables. Is this blue part connected? No, it's just totally okay, random. Is one of them connected? Uh, every, every blue piece is a triangle colored blue. See, if the, red, if the part of the rotation is small is connected, then it will be a conjecture. Uh, uh, I don't know any way to to know, since it's a uh, random triangulation, you can have high dilatation anywhere. You could have islands of high dilatation, islands of low dilatation, just by random chance. No, anyway, if, the, if the dilatation is very big, if that's isolated, these are really islands, uh, then, they, then they are okay. Then they are okay with the control. Uh -huh. but it's that long again. Well, that's an approach. But what I'm going to do now to get some statistics is I want a, a real random variable instead of uh, these random maps. So we have these companions to look at. And so I'm going to um, illustrate with a square. So, um, so I, one of the questions about randomness is what you do with the boundary. What I'm going to do is randomly distribute um, four times the square root of n points in the boundary. I don't know if that's the right number, but I, uh, I want to put endpoints inside, so I'm going to put some points in the boundary. And you don't have to do this. You can do entirely inside, but uh, the boundary effects can be a little bad. So I randomly triangulate by throwing endpoints inside, randomly distributed. Uniform in x and y is what I do. I just choose uniform x and y between 0 and 1. Put the points in randomly, and then I uh, delineate, triangulate that. And I think most people have have seen this. If not, the, the basic idea is that there's an essentially unique triangulation with a collection of points. If you uh, define the triangulation such that the circle circumscribing the triangle has no other vertices from your set inside of it, other, you know, it goes through three of them and it has no others inside of it. And it essentially uniquely determines this uh, triangulation for you. And so then you circle pack it. And you circle back it by choosing a point that's pretty close to that corner in the triangulation, one pretty close to that corner, that corner, that corner. Designate those as the corners and repack with the uh, boundary conditions to form a square, to, to form a rectangle. You don't know if it's a square. And in fact, you look at the length over the height. That's the aspect ratio. And you take the log of the aspect ratio. So that's a real variable, the log of the aspect ratio Throw a random triangulation in, circle packet, write down that number. I wanted to be uh, a little clearer about the map. So if I have that triangulation, I circle pack it. Now under the circle packing, remember, is a triangulation. That's exactly the same triangulation abstractly as that one. So I throw away the circles. 
And every triangle has a corresponding triangle, and I map those piecewise uh, at Miley on each face. So it's piecewise at my map. So those are the maps I'm talking about. I'm sorry. It's supposed to be the same triangulation. Up in the lower right hand corner, I see more edges and more pictures than the other. Um, well, you may not be able to see all the edges. Um, also, um, well, that's a good question. At least this corner is okay. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if that's resolution or not, but more or less good. Yeah. More or less good. So I run 5,000 trials with 3,200 points per trial. So 3,200 points you're throwing in, and four times the square root of that on the boundary, you're getting uh, 5,000 random triangulations. And for each one, you circle pack it, and you measure the log of the aspect ratio. And there's the graph you get. That's a histogram. Um, you want to put a um, curve to it. You try a, a, a Gaussian, and darn, it seems to do pretty well. In fact, uh, if you do a QQ plot, which is a way to compare uh, distributions, this is a dead-on straight line. Uh, it really looks like it's Gaussian. But uh, perhaps more convincing than a single one is to do a number of experiments. So, what I did with the square was I plotted 5,000 trials for each of uh, this collection. So I doubled the number of vertices each time and draw the distribution. And uh, you can see how it's peaking at the, um, the solution. Of course, the true value is zero here, log of uh, one over one. And so uh, what you find if you look at the variance is you do a log log plot of the variance. If you double the number of vertices, you're cutting the variance down by half, almost exactly. And this is true in almost every picture I'll show you. And uh, we'll see, I think, where that comes from, where it should come from. Well, the square is just a test case. You can do uh, rectangles quite easily. And so um, just uh, circle pack that. That's a random uh, rectangle. Do a few thousand. Uh, trials at different levels. Uh, that's supposed to be n equal 200, 800, 30, 200, and so on. The truth here is 0 0.6931. Now you do begin to see some boundary effects. A square you'd expect by symmetry to be centered beautifully at zero, so that was not a surprise. Um, here you see that the um, average, the mean of these curves, drifts slightly towards uh, the right value. Uh, but again, the uh, variance drops by uh, linearly, basically number of vertices. We can move off the plane, we can move to a torus at least. And here I'd like to talk with people about moving to other uh, surfaces. Uh, a torus is easy because you lay out um, the torus. This is a torus with uh, modulus 1 plus 4i over 2. So you just lay out a torus a parallelogram in the plane. You put random points in that and then you replicate that by the group action, and then you triangulate that and you cut out, you, you relabel the point so that it thinks it's on a triangle, on a uh, torus. And um, then you can circle pack the torus and you can actually read off the experimental modulus. And this is the, um, the, aver the uh, absolute values of the modulus. Um, and so again, you see that the variance, when I uh, multiply by four, the Variance drops by almost exactly one fourth. So let's go back to the region omega and see um, what happens uh, there, because uh, you can't have uh, boundary effects and so on. So as I increase the number of vertices, I'm picking up more and more features of the boundary, and again you see quite a drift in the mean. So it takes a little while before you narrowing down on what you think is the actual. Um, modulus of that curve family, extremal length of that curve family. Another potential way to um, look at the divergence is to do the harmonic measure. So um, here's what harmonic measure is, basically. So I have my uh, region omega, 
and I have these maps of the unit disk. So let's pick a base point. I just walk around here, normalize the arc length to one. And as I walk along um, the boundary, I see where the, what the argument does. And the argument uh, grows as I go around. And um, in regions where there's high harmonic measure, it will move rapidly. And in regions where it's low harmonic measure, it will move slowly. So I took um, fewer trials here, I think 100 trials with 200 vertices, and uh, plotted those. Um, they're almost fingerprints there. So I plotted those uh, on top of one another. And then I did it at three other levels here. And so you can see um, how this is um, behaving very nicely. So it's picking up harmonic measure better and better. I, don't, I didn't think of a way to measure the variance here or anything to see if you could measure the quality. I will point out that uh, occasionally on this last one, you'll see that uh, you do get some experimental uh, outliers based on whether the uh, circle packing algorithm quite finished. But, uh, so that's uh, 51,000 vertices. And uh, it's getting pretty close to what should be the actual harmonic measure of that uh, region. OK, here's uh, why that uh, should work. Let's take a uh, square and put 800 random points in it. Well, if I break it into uh, four pieces geometrically, each of those should have more or less 200 pieces in it. And now each one of those has an extremal length, for example, between the left and the right end. And if this one uh, is trying to be a square, if it, uh, on average, is a little uh, longer than a square, well, this one has an equal chance of being uh, more squat. And so when uh, you put them together, there's a sort of cancellation there of the thing you're measuring. And I think what's behind this is that this is sort of an infinitely divisible process. Or another way to say it is, as you uh, focus in more and more, this is emergent behavior. It's going to happen at stages. There's sort of a self-similarity uh, probabilistically. And it, the cancellation that you see, the reason the variances behave so well is that this cancellation is occurring uh, inside uh, the packet. I want to um, wrap up with some questions about what um, a random triangulation is. And uh, there's some subtlety here, because before working on random triangulations, I just worked on other triangulations, non-random. Well, at first, some of them seem random. So here in particular is one that I enjoy. And some of you may have seen me talk about this before. Um, this is from data of Jim Pan and Bill Floyd and Walter Perry. Um, they have uh, subdivision rules, subdivision tilings. So this is purely combinatorial right now. You start with the Pentagon, and the subdivision rule is you break it into um, five pentagons this way. This they call their twisted pentagon subdivision rule. Yeah, well, you have to put an extra vertex in each of those. So let's see how this goes. I start with the Pentagon, break it into five. You say those aren't Pentagons. Well, now those are Pentagons. Break each of those into five Pentagons, add the extra dots, and so on and so on. Well, this is, um, this is not a triangulation. If you go and put a barycenter in each one and put an uh, edge to each of the vertices, you get a triangulation. And to be honest with you, every time I see a triangulation, I circle pack it. Just so circle pack this. And so I circle pack stage seven after seven subdivision stages. Again, um, you're just seeing the pentagons. This was based on uh, bear centers and circles. And I've just wiped out all the bear centers and their edges and all the circles. So you're just seeing the original edges. So there's the uh, original. Uh, by forming the, the subdivision of the first pentagon. Now, the thing is, if you stare at this long enough, or at uh, even stage seven, uh, stage eight or nine, your eye begins to pick up some features. So there is a um, unexpected uh, 
cell similarity in here. And this picture is sort of uh, summarizes it. I look at that pattern, it's very faint here, so maybe you can't see it, but I outline the pentagons at the different stages. And those are the dark curves. You take those curves, isolate them, blow each one up by an appropriate factor and lay them over one another. And Ken and Floyd and Perry have proven this since then, that the, uh, the objects uh, exactly lay over one another. So it's subdividing every edge at each stage into three edges, but the vertices at the end are exactly vertices at the earlier stage. And so the vertices stay in place and you subdivide more and more and you get this fractal curve. So that was lying somehow in the combinatorics, right? So this was not at all a random uh, triangulation. But what you do is you put geometry on it and sort of anything that's the not random part of it sort of comes out and starts being visible once you put the geometry on it. So that's a little different. You might think of this in a sense as the abstract thing sort of had a random surface in mind and you pinned it down to what surface it should be thinking it lives in. And there it is. A different view of randomness is um, in practical situations. This is some uh, brain mapping work. So the idea is you have this uh, triangulated brain, and if you're a neuroscience researcher, you want to flatten this out so that you can put little pins in the map about what's happening in different parts of the cortex. And so um, I and a group have actually worked on this, uh, trying to develop these flat maps. Well, this, as far as the data goes, once they've processed it, which is a long and complicated thing, it's basically just a triangulated sphere. It's a triangulated sphere. Well, anytime you triangulate something, you should uh, circle pack it. So there's the uh, brain. There it's circle packed on the sphere. With color coding that uh, some of the uh, uh, neuroscientists put on it for different loads. And uh, we put some fake pieces in there. Well, you can take this part of it and project it to the plane, for example. And all of these are discrete and formal maps in our terminology. And so now you uh, can put that, say you identify four landmarks on the corners and make that a rectangle. And measure the extremal length. So that extremal length is one thing that's being used in some work, trying to be able to distinguish between different brains. You have to give some numbers to it and try to distinguish ones with schizophrenia and ones without it. So you put these numbers on and hope that the numbers distinguish, at least as part of a component with more information. My point here is, though, that now you are not in the situation of being able to randomly generate trials and uh, see some emergent conformal structure out of it. You're given, you know, maybe if you're lucky, you have 15 patients. You have 15 scans. So um, when we wrote this stuff in the literature, people complained, well, they said, but the conformal structure you claim to be putting on it with this flat map just depends on the combinatorics. And suppose I saw, moved some vertex out and, and made it geometrically different, but combinatorially the same. Your map doesn't distinguish that. Well, we have a partial defense now. Most of this data is, in some sense, random data. And to a certain extent, you have a more or less random triangulation, depending on the resolution, the person that processes it, whether they upsample, etc. I tried to call the brain services once a fictitious service, but they wouldn't allow that to start for them. But there's really, it's not clear there's a surface there, but you make a guess at the surface, and you have this somewhat random triangulation. If you want to put a conformal piece of information on it, what do you use? Well, you use a theorem that says your best guess at the random, uh, best guess at the conformal structure is to do this map sort of a central limit theorem, you know, what's your best guess if you're going to uh, flip 15 coins and you want to know how many heads and tails there are? You know, you use uh, standard um, notions of what probability distributions those trials converge to. So this is a different sense of random in that you have a very small data set and the question is whether you can make some kind of prediction about uh, the validity of a particular conformal structure on it. And my final picture is from uh, Rick Kenyon and Alexei uh, Konkov. 
And you may recognize this was on the notices cover, maybe within the past year. So this is a uh, random step surface. And basically, this is a, a corner, sort of, of a bunch of sugar cubes in space where it's been eroded. And um, that's one way to define a random structure. And uh, if I add another few days, I would have put up the circle packing picture of this, but it's not quite out yet. At any rate, uh, you have random surfaces and statistical mechanics, all sorts of um, applications. And so potentially, if you have a sort of emergent notion of uh, what the conformal structure is on these, it might be useful in these other topics. Yeah. Yeah, they're studying what are called wolf shapes, which is the shape, uh, so this has to do with the statistical mechanics of, of um, the material. And so um, it sort of erodes based on the properties of the, uh, the, the temperature and so on. And, the, and so it takes characteristic shapes. And um, what they prove, among many, many things, is that the uh, boundary of these, that cardioid, is an algebraic curve when you project it. But it's bullshit. I think that's... Yeah, uh, the random, uh, it's, it's in the material, so you can do some experiments, I think, sort of close to this. There's a random process. Extends to some analytic curve inside. Um, that's an experimental one. I'm not sure what the theory is. Yeah, I wish they knew more about it. I certainly uh, find that there are a lot of places um, where random surfaces come up in practical situations. And again, you'd like to see if nature organizes itself. I mean, we would all like to think that nature, nature's natural way of treating a surface is to think of it as conformal. And so maybe nature does think of these surfaces as conformal. Yeah, that, that emerges naturally. I don't know about the parking lot, but this uh, on these years, it certainly does. Okay, my acknowledgments, and again, thanks to the speakers, and thanks to you in the audience. Thank you. Are <laughs> further questions for the for Ken? In the first program, so you had a bias towards the negative. Was that, again, a square thing you were trying to pull back, or something else? It may have been a rectangle. Okay. If you think uh, about the boundary effects, on a rectangle, it will sort of, if you think, for example, of your random triangulation as sort of being equally distant from the ends and the edges, that sort of makes the aspect ratio of the region that's actually triangulating somewhat different than the aspect ratio of the original region. So I think some of those are boundary effects. Um, and so one big question is, how, how should I distribute points in the boundary, or should I just use points inside? There's problems with that. And whether I should use Delaunay, I'd be very interested in uh, people at, at the meeting know of other methods of uh, randomly triangulating things, because it's very subtle why the Delaunay triangulation uh, comes in here. I mean, I don't know why, but that's a natural thing to use. And then you think about it in hindsight, um, why does that uh, work? And that's an open question in my mind, but quite an interesting question about how, how you should make random triangulation. Well, is there a connection between the conformal factor and the aspect ratio of these triangles? And when they're really... Yeah, yeah, there's a direct connection. You can't bound K, but what happens somehow, and, and maybe it's uh, related to the connection to, with the regions that are lower K, things on average balance out. So if you take a rectangle and break it in half, 
say a two by one rectangle, break it into two one by one squares, if one tries to stretch one way, the other is equally likely to stretch the other way, and when you put them together, they sort of cancel the stretch and you get. You know, it's, it's okay to use the expression here sometimes. What's the cost of curvature of the brain? So does the brain. Uh, and experimentally, it seems as if large parts of the brain can be flattened rather easily. But when you go into the salt center jar, uh, one of the curvature is pretty small. Uh, so, but now you try to sort of verify whether or not that's true. When you have this MRI where they're the other one, Sort of integrates out, yeah. Yeah. Do you have a question? Oh, um, a lot of it. You could, to certain types of regions. So if you want to map um, a multiply connected plane region to the disk with some disks removed, that's very very immediate. If you wanted to map it to a disk with slits, that's another matter. So certain things is very well tuned for, other things uh, you'd have to work more. Yeah. Reminds me of the Bruins map of the end of the pilot. Anything interesting? Um, I don't know, but there's a student at a college in Michigan who's been working with uh, Penrose tiling and doing circle packings. Um, I was supposed to see him in uh, New Orleans. I didn't, but he won a prize at the student poster session on this. Um, one thing that seemed to come up is that certain of the circles um, seem to have the same size. Uh, so there isn't, there isn't a periodicity, which would guarantee that certain circles have the same size because you uh, recognize the symmetry in the circle packing. But uh, there's no not symmetry like that there. And so it was quite a surprise that uh, certain circles in the Penrose tiling uh, packing seem to have the same size. Uh, so he is uh, investigating that. But I don't know uh, much about the result. Yeah. Uh, uh, Yeah, I should I should try that. Really, if you have a triangulation, send it to me. But let me give you the format so you can convert it to my format. Anything else? Let's let the speaker again.